Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending upon where everyone's calling in from. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all in this virtual room. Uh, my name is Cesar Del Valle. I'm the Director of Partnerships here at Candid. Uh, I'm based out of our New York office and calling in from Brooklyn this morning. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be able to take part in this conversation. Uh, and I'm joined today uh, by uh, two phenomenal speakers uh, to have an extra uh, extraordinary conversation on what many of us love, which is taxonomy. Uh, so I'm joined by uh, Sarah Keyholtz, uh, who's the Senior Manager of Data and Strategic Insights at Women's Funding Network, and from my colleague, Laia Grigno, who's the Director of Data Discovery at Candid. Uh, today, we'll be speaking about Candid's philanthropy classification system uh, and how the taxonomy is meant to provide a shared language for the field and is one of the most important ways in which Candid makes its data useful and accessible. What we're trying to achieve today is really to dive a little bit deeper into what is our taxonomy, um, what it takes um, on our end to actually maintain it, uh, and how Canada is actively working with partners uh, such as the Women's Funding Network to ensure that the PCS remains as relevant as possible. Uh, what we're hoping to achieve in today's conversation is for all of you to have a more granular understanding of what PCS is and how it shows up in the resources and the services that we provide, uh, and to learn how Candid works with external partners uh, to update and improve the taxonomy. Um, and of course, to give you a little bit of a sneak peek as to some of the PCS changes that are being proposed uh, and reviewed um, as we speak. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to really begin um, by speaking uh, directly with yourself, Sarah. Uh, again, it's a, a pleasure uh, and a privilege to be able to have you join us for today's conversation. Uh, I believe many of us are familiar with the work of Women's Funding Network, but would love to just start there just in case anyone on this conversation is not. Um, if you could share a little bit more about who Women's Funding Network is, what you stand for, uh, and of course, a little bit more about yourself and your role as a senior manager of data and strategic insights, please. Thank you so much for that introduction. And, and I want to um, say how honored and excited I am to be here today. Um, I am very uh, happy about the work that Candid is doing and Women's Funding Network's uh, role in that. So um, Women's Funding Network is a philanthropy support organization, and we represent a coalition of women's funds and gender, gender justice funders in the US and around the world. So in other words, we are a network of networks. Our goal is to drive funding, power, and resources to funders in the gender justice movement, um, with an emphasis on funders and organizations working at the intersection of race and gender. Our members are tackling systemic problems at the local level, um, through leadership development, uh, movement building, uh, advocacy, research, and of course, grant making, all through a racial and gender justice lens. We are an, a proud intersectional feminist organization that believes that those closest to the problems should be closest to the power. Um, so as a membership organization, a big part of my role is to ensure that our members work is accurately, rep accurately represented within our own internal database. Um, I, my background is in Salesforce platform app building and administration. Um, and our goal is to track trends and emerging themes and report on change over time in terms of our members' work. I also work to ensure that our members are represented in external systems like Handed PCS. Um, I was listening to a podcast about the census a few years ago and the consequences of undercounting communities. And something the speaker said, and I don't remember the podcast, but something the speaker said really struck with me over time. And that is what gets measured gets funded. And so I want to ensure that our members work gets funded and to do so, they need to be accurately represented in these systems. Thank you. Powerful introduction, Sarah. Thank you very much. I think it um, echoes a bit of what we just heard and may share in the investments that Candid is making around creating equitable access. And I think especially the way that you're framing those closest to the problem should be the closest to the power uh, and in essence to the solution. I think it's a big reason why we are trying to um, take a very concerted, inclusive effort anytime we do go through some of these revisions. And with that, I wanted to turn to, to Laia Guirino um, who I, I, I would hope and assume that most of us are familiar with Candid here, uh, but Candid, uh, sorry, Laia is Candid's data discovery, data uh, director of data discovery. Uh, so I feel like many of us could presume and assume what that may mean, but would love to hear from your own words, Laia. What does that actually mean and what's a day in your life? Sure, that's um, 
a question I often get data discovery sounds like something exciting, but maybe not intuitive in terms of like what it actually means in practice. So um, I've been at Candid for about six years in this role leading the data discovery team and it's evolved a bit, but I'd say that my primary focus is essentially trying to bring the field more real time data about what's happening in the sector, especially related to grant making. So, you know, we've put out various blog posts showing just how bad the timeliness of IRS data has become. And as we go through crisis after crisis after crisis, I think there's an increasing recognition that the sector can't rely on data that's two to three years old to make decisions about what it needs to do today. And so we are taking a hard look at how we can complement the data we do get from the IRS to update it with information about what organizations and what funders are doing now. So whether that be data that's contributed by funders themselves, data that we find on funder websites or news sources or social media, we're just trying to bring the sector more real time data so they can act most appropriately given today's context, not the context three years ago. Um, another important aspect of my work though is to improve the quality of Candid's data. So we don't wanna just put out vast amounts of data out there. We want that data to be reliable and trusted. And so I play a role in our data governance processes. And um, a big part of that is paying close attention to how our data gets coded as well. So how our data gets coded and when we are talking about quality, how then does that uh, overlap and interplay with Candid's uh, philanthropy classification system? So could you share a little bit more about the PCS in particular and how uh, Candid uses it and leverages it? Sure, so I think most of the audience will be familiar with the PCS because you all are working with nonprofits all the time and trying to get them funding or helping them find funding. but for those that might not be as familiar with the taxonomy, on a technical level, the PCS is just the taxonomy that Candid uses to classify its data, whether that be data on organizations, on transactions, so like grants um, and other forms of funding, news articles or, or reports. And there's five facets. Uh, so we describe subjects, the issue areas that organizations focus on or that a, a grant is about populations who is being served by the work or funding, support strategies. So what form does that support take? Or is it capacity building support, general support, um, advocacy, and then transaction types, which describe, is this a cash grant? Is it a mission related investment or program related investment? Is it a grant to an individual? And then finally, we have organization types. Uh, which is uh, self-evident. Uh, so that's the, what the taxonomy is on a practical level. And like I said, we use it to, to classify all of our data, but on a guess more theoretical or principle level, the PCS is what makes Candid's data useful. So over the decades, we've collected data on over 2 million organizations, more than 24 million, grants and making sense of that mountain of data would be absolutely impossible if we hadn't classified it. If, if we hadn't translated how each individual organization describes its own work and put it into a common language that we can use to understand the sector of the work as a whole. Um, so I, I really think that, that it's critical and I'd say also just on a practical level, it's how we make our data accessible to our users. So um, whether you're in our products using the filters, if you're doing a natural language search on FDO saying, I wanna find funding to you know, end homelessness in San Francisco, all of that is being translated into the taxonomy to basically help you find the data that you need to do whatever you're, you're coming to Candid to, to do that day. Um, it's how we, often present data in our funding, our foundation landscapes and regional dashboards on foundation funding in different places around the country. And it's often what we use to present data in our reports. So you'll just, you can't see something by Candid and not run into the taxonomy basically. 
think that's a helpful uh, understanding as to how, again, it's it's uh, deeply integrated into all of our products, resources, services. Um, I would be wary that perhaps hearing that description, it sounds like something static that simply exists, but it's quite dynamic and it's quite alive. Uh, and as it's being modified and changed, um, can you share a little bit more about what the revision process actually entails when we are making changes to the PCS? Um, how often is it revised and what exactly is the process of doing so? Sure. Um, so if you think about the, the whole history of Candid and its predecessor institutions, the, the taxonomy has changed quite a lot. We started with NTEE codes, found those a little lacking in several areas. You know, the, the NTE doesn't really describe the populations that are, are served by, by work and, and other aspects of the philanthropic sector. So then Foundation Center uh, created its own taxonomy, then another version. So the philanthropy classification system was released around 2014 or 2015. Um, we did one other update in 2019. And as we change the taxonomy, we're trying to balance two things. So one, I think for obvious reasons, we do have to maintain stability in the taxonomy. It's something that we use, but it's also something that external actors use, uh, whether it's, it's funders or um, technology companies that are also trying to make the nonprofit sector more, more accessible. And so if we were changing the taxonomy all the time, it would actually make it very hard to use our data. Um, but we also recognize that the, the terms that we use to describe the work of the sector has to evolve with the sector. So as the sector changes, as the nature of the work that's being done and, and just what is being done changes, the taxonomy needs to keep up with that. This round of taxonomy updates, we use a slightly different approach than the one in the previous uh, round, which the, the last time the taxonomy was updated, as I said, was 2019. This time we wanted to open up the process a little bit more. And so here I'll just share my, my screen just to give you a sense of the, the timeline and of, of how we've been approaching this. So at the beginning of this year, we went out and solicited input from about 60 organizations. Um, these were partners of Candid, funders that we knew were using the taxonomy to classify their work, and just asked them for, for input on, on how we could improve the philanthropy classification system. And so they could recommend changes to term labels, you know, language changes in the sector all the time, uh, changes to definitions. They could suggest that we rearrange terms in the taxonomy combine terms, remove terms, or add terms. Um, and then we, as staff, has, have spent the last several months reviewing all the input that we got through that process. I think overall, we received over 600 recommendations. Um, and just to put that in context, the taxonomy as a whole has just over 1,200 uh, terms. So it was quite a bit of feedback to process. And um, so went through several groups internally, um, looked over those suggestions, which did also include some input from candid staff that like works with the taxonomy and our data all the time. And now we're at the point where uh, actually next week I'll be presenting the, the changes that we've decided um, or whether they're moving forward to, to senior management for review and approval. Um, we do also just recognizing that not everyone provided input into the, this first part here, wanna put out the proposed changes out for public comment before we actually implement them to again, just give the sector one last opportunity to let us know whether we got it right or not. Um, and so then once we go through that public comment period, we'll, we'll see, you know, what the feedback is, finalize what the changes will be, and then prepare for implementation. And just to, you know, be honest, we are still working on the timeline for when these changes will be rolled out, because it is a considerable lift to, um, to put those out there. 
So I think you you shared quite a bit about the process, Lai, and I think it's definitely quite a balancing act to kind of uh, create a stability between uh, maintaining stability in the terminology and in the taxonomy, and of course, being mindful of the evolution of some of these terms and, and being as up-to-date as possible, uh, and having nearly 50% of all terms, having some level of recommendations, I'm sure was not an easy feat to try to manage. Um, can you share a little bit more? Is there a place where those in this conversation can see some of those changes? Uh, and is there even a way for you to share some previews of some of the changes that might be coming and being considered currently? Yeah, so um, this is a preview of some of the, the changes we're considering making. So this is, these are some of the new terms we're considering adding to our subject taxonomy. Uh, and just so you all are not like frantically writing all of this down, um, obviously the session is being recorded, but also, as I said, we will be putting this out for public comment. So you'll have, you know, we'll have a place where you could see every change that's being proposed um, or, you know, once the candidates executive team has a chance to review these. But as you can see, it's a mix of things, it, you know, introducing terms that capture work that's become more like important, um, going deeper into like high issue areas that we, you know, we may have only had one term before and just given the importance of the issue that doesn't seem sufficient any longer. So allowing people to find more finer grain details about what they're looking for. Um, just a, a variety of, of those types of changes. I also wanted to highlight um, another important type of change that we're making, which is term label changes. Uh, we got quite a bit of this for the population uh, facet in particular. Um, so these are changes from both like clarifying what we mean by certain terms. So for example, we're proposing to add age ranges next to the term because we know that not everyone uh, defines children using the, age the same age range or youth with the same age range. Um, clarifying language. So what does transitioning children mean? Like that could be misconstrued. And so, you know, just for clarity, updating the label and then, you know, getting rid of kind of offensive or hurtful language. So not using dropouts uh, and, and instead just, you know, saying out of school used to be more respectful of that youth and using more people first language was something that we saw a lot in the feedback that we received. And the last thing I'll, I'll just highlight, I think the term additions tend to be more exciting to, to share. So wanted to um, share other new terms that we're adding for the population taxonomy. I think some folks might be excited to see people living in rural areas as a term that we're considering adding since that has been also an important component of equity conversations um, and then some organization types here. So. That's a sneak preview, but like I said, um, once the public comment period is open, you'll be able to see everything. Thanks, Leia. I think we're getting a better sense of the process uh, and then how that trickle down process actually makes some of these changes come to life. I, I do want to turn it over to Sarah to get a better sense and understanding how, of how she and WFN were involved. Um, before we do so, though, I feel like much of what you just shared, Laya, is kind of quantitative and process oriented. Uh, can you touch really briefly on how the notion of trust is really integral to this revision process? So I, Anne May, at the beginning of this, uh, or in her opening remarks, you know, said that Candid's goal is to get the sector, or get you the information you need to do good. And I, I'd add to be better, so be more efficient, more equitable, more effective, and achieving that mission requires that people trust Candid and trust its data. And so um, we really want organizations to feel like they're partners with Candid in creating the reliable, timely data that it needs to, to carry out its work and make decisions. And so in the revision process, we just wanted to make sure that the those who shared feedback felt that Candid was seriously considering its feedback and respected the time that they'd taken in sharing that feedback with us. Because we got very thoughtful recommendations that will make the taxonomy much better than, than it is now. So 
um, whether that was meeting one on one with folks to um, share more about the taxonomy in the first place, or like following up with them via email to make sure that we understood the recommendations they were making, or then following up with everyone to share the status of uh, where we'd landed, which of the recommendations we made. That's how we tried to show um, that we valued the feedback they were taking the time to share. Helpful to hear the intentionality there and excited to hear Sarah's perspective on her personal lived experience and contributing some feedback. Uh, but Sarah, kind of turning to you now, having a better sense of the audience and their understanding of it, and very much having heard recently Laya's uh, perspective on our process, our intentionality. Could you share a little bit more about uh, the role that you played uh, in creating some of these changes and recommendations? Uh, how and why uh, WFN was playing that role? Um, and a little bit more about the feedback that you were able to provide, please. Yes, um, so thank you. Before I go into how WFN got involved, I wanted to say how much I appreciate that you brought up the idea of trust. Um, this is a, a very important to our organization and to our members who are operating at the forefront of many of these innovative, even radical power sharing philanthropic practices that, um, that Anne Bay brought up. Um, they've been doing this before the pandemic, um, things like trust-based philanthropy, um, participatory grant making, uh, and things like that. So I would like to acknowledge um, how Candid built trust with us um, through Laya and the Candid team's responsiveness throughout the process. And I'll touch back on that in a moment. Um, but so I got involved with women's, uh, I got involved because Women's Funding Network is a member of Change Philanthropy. Um, and this is a coalition of about 10 philanthropy support organizations working from a variety of perspectives to push philanthropy toward greater equity and justice. And I would especially like to uplift the leadership of Tanaja Jordan of that group who brought us together with Candid and also helped us develop a strategy for approaching um, the changes. Um, the timing was perfect for me because I was just working on our member strategy our member survey, and I'd been modifying our database to track our member programming. So I'd been wrestling with a lot of these same struggles. How do we keep a through line through the past while adapting to the future? Um, and our so our own taxonomy was fresh in mind. Um, and to be honest, I was somewhat skeptical at first about the whole process. I wondered if Candid was just doing a listening tour um, and giving us an opportunity to vent um, because um, you know, there are things that we come up against it again and again in the old taxonomy. Um, and I wondered how they could actually take action um, on all this feedback. Um, so, um, but then Laya showed up with her spreadsheets and um, she'd analyzed all of Change's taxonomy. So Change has its own taxonomy and she'd analyzed uh, Change's taxonomy in the context of Candid and she brought counts and the number of gaps and overlaps. And I thought, okay, this is serious. And um, so I'm not being too hyperbolic when I say that I think we were all shocked and also pleasantly surprised. Um, and then Laya continued to follow up with each of us um, with questions and updates and status. Um, and it was, everything was so personal and everything was so thoughtful. I was actually on vacation with some friends when I got an email from Laya with clarifications about my submissions. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. Um, my friends were pounding on the door shouting, no work, <laughs> stop. And I was like, no, you don't understand. Access to childcare is on the line. I'm answering this email. So um, so just to bring it back to the idea of trust, I, I think that Laya and the Candon team really um, built trust through this responsive and transparent process. And I, I moved from skeptic to, to participant um, and I really appreciated it. Uh, uh, yeah. Appreciate the, the passion that shines through <laughs> and it's beautiful to hear that the intentionality was able to turn into reality there. Uh, and I think you've touched a little bit, Sarah, as to some of the terms that are really important to you and, and why this revision is important to WFN. But can you share a little bit more about like specific feedback that you may have provided? Yeah, um, so I knew that many of my fellow organizations within the change research group were working on populations and language that that Laya mentioned. Um, so I was focused on the subjects and I approached the PCS from two perspectives, one as an advocate for the work of our members, and then also as a database nerd. <laughs> so given that this is an aud audience of library professionals, I invite you all to give a shout out in the chat if you also identify as a database nerd. Um, want to hear from my people. 
Um, so in terms of the first perspective, uh, do our members see their work represented in the taxonomy? Um, this was very important. So with access, to, going back to access to, to childcare, for example, if an organization is working on access to childcare for frontline workers as an economic and employment issue, and their grants are categorized as childcare as a human services issue, um, which is the closest available term, they may get missed by funders who are looking to invest in the care economy. Or to put it another way, um, how organizations are coded is often how they are seen from an external perspective. So Laya mentioned those um, uh, big other, other databases that are, that are built off of candidates coding system. Um, a taxonomy is ultimately a power structure and a system of naming. So it's a huge responsibility to get it right. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> uh, that was a couple of mic drops. Uh, definitely uh, how they are coded is how they are seen. Uh, and I think for some of us, especially those of us that were on the lower end of the spectrum, as far as our familiarity with PCS, to hear that taxonomy is just is not just simply a, a codifying mechanism, but it's really about power structures as well. Um, it's it's really, really helpful to to hear that. Um, and I, I love that you touched a little bit on your members and the applicability of that and not just how you're engaging with change and other networks of networks. Um, so it's, it's beautiful to see where we're at today. And I think, again, I wanted to express first and foremost, a, a deep level of gratitude and appreciation for yourself and for many others like you that may be also data nerds that have been contributing to the evolution and to the progression of the PCS at large. Uh, we've been having a number of, of different questions and, and comments roll, and I, I did want to read one comment really quickly um, from someone uh, in, in, in the audience today that was saying that they really appreciated these changes and that they find them to be great, um, that these are the types of terms that people are using and that the examples that you shared, Liar, are very po powerful and relevant, um, and it's great to see some of these changes that we're considering. Um, I did want to turn... Can I, of course. Sorry, can I just jump in there? I for Sarah, just thank you. Sarah's too nice. Uh, <laughs> um, but like, just when you said that, like you were, you told your friends, wait, access to childcare is on the line. I think that's so important because a taxonomy can seem really dry. Like, why does this really matter? Why are we spending so much time agonizing over this? And anyone who's like ever worked to try to come up with a taxonomy knows how painful an exercise that can be. And it matters because it's how you understand the work of the, the sector. It's more than just words. Like you said, it reflects like priorities or reflects what, what matters, what gets measured, gets funded. And so having a term signifies that something is important enough to, to measure and keep track of. And so that's like, I think that's really important. So to me, like the taxonomy is not this dry abstract thing. It's, it's a really powerful way of making the, the sector and the world better. That might seem like an exaggeration, but it's just like you, data has power to change things and you need for data to be useful. You need to be able to make meaning of it. And a taxonomy is the key way that you do that. I, I really appreciate that perspective. And I think that another area that could seem dry, but is actually very relevant is how data rolls up. So this is the data nerd side of me. I was also looking at um, how all those subject categories roll up into the parent categories, because this is often how organizations are classified at a top level. Um, and one of the things that was coming up for us is that at the top level, if you were to compare um, abortion rights groups with anti-abortion groups, um, they almost appeared exactly the same. So if you looked at Susan B. Anthony list and Planned Parenthood New York, you would get um, you would get a snapshot that looked very similar in terms of a percentage of human rights funding, civic participation, and reproductive health care. Um, so it wasn't just adding new terms that we were so that we're so excited about, but it was also reorganizing the structure in a way that's going to yield better data and better insight, um, regardless of, of, of what you're working on. So we're very grateful for, for that. So I know we've been talking a lot about the process, the revisions, the changes and the modifications uh, and the ambition and moving in the right direction. 
We did have a question, however, around looking backwards a little bit um, as we are coming up with new terms. Um, how would these terms be applied retroactively to past grants? Yeah, so this cuts that. Um, so what happens once you've settled on what the new taxonomy is going to be? It's actually quite a, a lift um, because it's not just about putting the new terms and definitions out there or the changes out there. Um, we actually go through a series of steps to make this a living thing in our products. And so that includes um, retraining our auto classifier. So while Candid has staff who take the time to manually you know, code organizations and grants, obviously when we're processing 4 million grants a year, we don't have the staff capacity to do that entirely manually. And so we do have an auto classifier um, that's been trained to assign codes. Uh, so we have to retrain that. Then we do recode all of our data according to our new taxonomy. So it's not just these data will be coded with this taxonomy from 2022 or 2023 to the present, but like it goes back. So all of our data gets recoded. Um, we need to update taxonomies and products, uh, make sure we're not, breaking anything, like if you had a saved search in a, in, in a tool you're using, making sure that we translate that to the, the new taxonomy. Um, and then of course, like training our, our staff and communicating with others about the changes that, they, that we've made so that if they're using the PCS, they're you know updating to the, the newest version. So it is a big lift, we estimate that it, It'll take at least three months. Like that's like the, the kind of level of, of effort that we initially are, are estimating. Um, so, so yeah, expect to see this taxonomy applied to historical data as well, not just what will be coming new after the new taxonomy is released. Thanks, Eli. And we are getting a few additional questions trickling in. Um, we'll have a few more uh, minutes here uh, uh, for additional questions. So please, an invitation for anyone to, to share anything else that may be coming to mind, because I know at least for myself, I'm quite grateful to hear that something that could potentially feel very uh, dry, such as taxonomy, is actually quite dynamic, quite alive. And the ramifications that that has on our day-to-day -day work, um, whether it be a candidate, whether it be um, at a partner organization or whether it be at a direct service organization, uh, and especially on how philanthropic capital flows um, are affected by some of these changes. Um, you know, we've been speaking a little bit about, you know, Sarah, you mentioned how some of this rolls up um, in parent terminologies. Um, there's a question around, will these terms be replacing any previous terms that were already being used? Uh, and if so, what happens then? So some of the terms, one of the examples I uh, shared up there were um, affordable housing and eviction protection as new terms. Those actually will be a replacement for a term that we're removing, housing loss prevention. They're more specific. They're more intuitive. Like, um, you know, to me, it's kind of, I live in San Francisco, and so homelessness and housing have been top of mind for like the entire time I lived here and the fact that we didn't have a term for affordable housing um, just showed like why improving the, the taxonomy is important. It's a more intuitive way. It's probably how people would search for data. So we would just recode things to the new terms as, as applicable in those cases. Uh, thanks, Lai. And, and I know that I think uh, some of us heard some of the numbers that you shared around having over 1,200 different terms. Uh, and there's a question around if we actually need to memorize all of these specific words or if uh, with some of these taxonomic changes that we're having, if there's going to be an opportunity for natural language search functionalities uh, and how that would actually look from the user experience perspective. Yeah, we say all the time that we don't expect users or we shouldn't expect users to be experts in our taxonomy. It is an overwhelming number. Most of the, the staff at Candid who do extremely valuable work, their work is actually what makes the auto classifier possible. Um, and I have, you know, over the years, I've just grown to respect 
more and more what they do because coding data is actually very difficult. It's not a, a clear process. It's very subjective. And so you have to use your, your judgment. You have to be very familiar with the, the taxonomy and all the terms and the nuances be, um, between the terms. But that said, we think that's our role as candid um, to be the experts in our taxonomy the experience I think we want to provide for our users is making it easy to find what you're looking for. And so in, in several of our products, you don't have to use our taxonomy to filter for and, and find the things that you're looking for. We just want you to be able to type in a phrase like you would do on Google and we'll deliver the data that you're, you're looking for. Um, we also, uh, but, but you know, in cases that you, you do want to look through the taxonomy on taxonomy.candid.org, there is a form. So if you do have questions, you can just send us a message that way and one of our taxonomy experts will follow up with you to answer any questions you might have. So I think as you're sharing more uh, around the uh, ramifications and the, the many tentacles of this work, why we're getting more and more questions roll in. Uh, I am a bit mindful of time, so I want to take a pause on the questions. And I think what I'd love to hear, uh, especially from from you, Sarah, is you know, as we were learning a little bit more about what Women's Funding Network stands for, uh, the way that you want to ensure that you're representing your members. For many of us that want to learn more, like where can we go to follow your work, uh, and when can we, where can we go to learn more about it beyond just this conversation? Well, thank you for that question. Um, so as community organizations in this audience, I would recommend that you all um, look up your local women's fund and find out what they are doing. We have a directory on our website um, at www.womensfundingnetwork.org. And, um, and so whether it's, it's research, um, it's uh, grant making, uh, leadership, uh, the women's funds are, um, are doing incredible work. So I, I would recommend getting in touch with them. Um, also, I saw a question uh, during Ann May's presentation about um, uh, demographics of staff leadership and board of foundations. And I wanted to highlight the work of um, the change um, group as well in that area. Um, there will be a report released in December on um, philanthropic, let's see, no, diversity amongst philanthropic professionals, um, which is a very comprehensive look at, um, at uh, foundation staff leadership and board um, from a variety of perspectives. So I would like to, to uplift that work. And what about yourself? Can we poke you on LinkedIn or should we follow you on Twitter? <laughs> Um, I'm not on Twitter, but uh, uh, yes, poke me on, on LinkedIn or um, uh, send me an email. Um, tell me what, what you're doing um, and how I uh, might be able to help. So. Um, Thanks, Sarah. Appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> so and I just want to jump into, please. sorry, can I just say one thing? I Like in the previous session, Ann May was giving a shout out to the Fin Network partners who do so much to make our data accessible to, to nonprofits and others. I just want to say that partners like uh, Sarah and WFN serve another really important function, which is like deriving greater insights from our data. At, at Candid, we're mostly generalists. We don't have the expertise or the, the time just managing the data as a full-time job. So we don't like have the, the time or always the capacity to dive deep into specific issues. And so it's just really gratifying to actually see our data being put to use um, by partners like uh, WFM. Thank you both. Um, considering we have a lot of our fin partners online, uh, and some of those um, are coming from international communities, we did have a question just around the languages that are supported with this conversation. So we're talking about taxonomy. Um, is this only applicable uh, to, uh, to kind of the English language, or is there any other languages that this would also be applicable for? It's a great question. Um, so Candid ultimately would love to serve the global social sector um, in the way that we've been serving the United States in, in the past. Um, right now, the taxonomy is only available in, in English. But one thing that we have tried to be mindful of is even if it's in English, that it be as internationally relevant and applicable as possible so that the terms 
that we use don't have such a US specific meaning that like they wouldn't be recognizable to folks in other countries. And actually that was some of the nature of the feedback that we received was to change term labels so that they would be more applicable in an international context. Um, as candid uh, global work grows, I would expect that we would start making the, the taxonomy available in other languages. And I, I do also know that organizations similar to Candid in other countries sometimes have looked to the, the PCS as a starting point, at least for developing their own taxonomy. Like Australia has a, this is also still in English, but Australia has a version of the taxonomy that they've adapted to, to better reflect the context there. Thanks, Laya, sharing out a little bit of our future ambitious plans, uh, which I think many of us are very excited about. Um, you shared previously a little bit about how the changes to these terms would be um, retroactively applied to past grants, and we did get a follow-up question on that. If you could share um, a bit on the timeline of how long it normally takes to see these retroactive updates uh, in our records. So that question, the, the timing of that is actually caught up in the, the timeline for rolling out the new taxonomy in the first place. So we wouldn't release the new taxonomy before we'd had a chance to recode all the data. We consider that like a key part of releasing the updated version of the taxonomy. So again, as we uh, nail down the, the timing for the implementation of these changes, we'll share that out. Um, but for now, just consider that it will be like not just the, the taxonomy release, but the candid data updated to reflect the new taxonomy as well at the same time. I actually have a follow up question about that. Um, will you be retaining the, the previous taxonomy so that we can compare um, changes that have been made um, to understand the difference? Yeah, so one, th one thing we did in the 2019 release was have a a, a tab in the in the spreadsheet, which you can download from taxonomy.candid.org that has the, the term names and definitions, um, which can be an easier way to, to navigate the taxonomy than, than the, the website for some folks. Um, so there was a tab summarizing all the changes there. We might do it a little bit differently, just given the number of changes this time around, but yes, you will be able to compare one version to the other. I'm uh, being mindful of time, and I think we're just about going to be wrapping up the conversation. So wanted to first and foremost, just extend a tremendous amount of gratitude. Uh, thank you, Laya, for sharing a little bit more of what's happening behind the curtain here at Candid. And, and, and most definitely, thank you, Sarah, very much for coming on, sharing your involvement, your perspective, your intentionality, and what your process uh, has been like, and what your reaction has been to our own. Uh, so thank you both very much. And I think the last question that I did want to ask, uh, which I think can help close us out, is a question around, is this an ongoing project? And if so, what does that look like for years to come? It's ongoing in the sense that the taxonomy, this won't be the last time we update the taxonomy. Um, the, I apologize if I didn't say this before, but we tend to update the taxonomy about every three years, I would say. So there will be a future round. Um, and and hope that uh, aware this has helped grow awareness of the taxonomy and that more folks will share their thoughts on how the taxonomy could improve in the future. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And wanted to thank, of course, everyone here uh, for your contributions, your questions, your comments, uh, and your engagement. Thanks, everyone. Uh, and looking forward to seeing everyone else at future sessions. Have a great rest thank of the you. day.